government's job is to provide good governance. And good governance is about touching lives and creating opportunities for citizens to thrive through strategic policies. And this has been the hallmark of Professor Baba Ganazulum's 10 packed development agenda in Borno in the last two and a half years. Welcome to Borno Restoration. I am Jesse Tofida. But first, let's bring you up to speed with Borno today. The multifaceted climate change and its effects, ranging from desertification, drought, flooding, and the near disappearance of the Lake Chad Basin, puts the region in dire straits. This informed the decision by the NEDC to organize this training on adaptation strategies for climate resilience. The training is to address the use of energy efficient stoves to mitigate the devastating effect of climate change. We want them to understand what brings about climate change and how are we going to adapt to climate change when it comes, especially the burning of uh, bush, the cutting of trees when there's shortage of rain. How can you supplement the rain that has been shortened? The NEDC's goal is to discourage the use of firewood as a strategy to combat global warming. If there will be strategies that these companies too will adopt to, it will be very good. I have so that it will cause less damage to the people in the environment. Not only the people practicing the activities, but even the people living within the community. Because if you go to the farms now, your farm will not be near your house. So the person that will be affected will be the man in the village because your farm is in the rural area. It's very, very important because I have the knowledge of a, a lot of things. When there is that uh, materials, gradually as this charcoal have effect, we gradually reduce it. The women are expected to foster the push towards protecting the environment. At the end of the workshop, certificates Energy-efficient stoves and cash were given to the women, courtesy of the North East Development Commission. Another season when Nigerians will be involved in rigorous electioneering has started in earnest with the kick-off of campaigns. In line with the timetable of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, the campaign activities will culminate in elections to choose leaders to run the affairs of the country for the next four years. During these times, where the passions of the electorate are high, security of lives and property is crucial. This is why the State Police Command has organized a joint security meeting to chart the way towards a peaceful campaign season. Representatives from all the security outfits are here for the meeting. What was discussed was election security. And uh, the ultimate is how to go about the election security to ensure that 2023 became a fruitful and peaceful war. Peace war. For any as national assignment that is coming up, so that uh, at the end of the day we have a, a good result. Top on the agenda is how best to intensify security presence across the state during and after campaigns and the need for resilience by security operatives towards credible elections. Certainly, uh, democracy has come to stay in the country. As such, we should not be left alone. So it's a process and uh, in the making we will be able to encounter a lot of uh, challenges here and there. But uh, being proactive, will uh, make us to uh, have a very peaceful atmosphere where the politician will take its uh, proper shape. The meeting resolves to adhere to the ban on the use of quasi-security groups in campaigns by political actors and to enhance security deployment across the state. It further calls politicians to abstain from using head speeches that will likely cause harm and distort the peace being enjoyed in the state.
Borno State has been in the spotlight when it comes to social economic development. Professor Babake Nazulum has been raising the bar, especially in the provision of special intervention for the downtrodden in the society. Let's take this report. For 12 years now, armed conflict has left more than 2 million people displaced in the northeast of Nigeria, making it one of the world's most complex humanitarian emergencies. As people fled their homes in search for safety, they also lost their means of livelihood and many of them struggled to meet their ancestral needs. But the Zulum administration is not sitting idly by as it continues to swim against the tide by providing livelihood support to the people. Over the past two and a half years, several projects were put in place by the Borno state government all in an effort to assist the vulnerable groups in the society. The year 2022 started with a series of activities by the Zulum administration to see how survivors of the insurgency are catered for. The governor met with the United Nations Under Secretary General and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths, as well as the Acting Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator for Nigeria, Matthias Kemley, to chart a way forward on how best to provide livelihood support to the vulnerable people. Our vision in the humanitarian community that I lead is of a world where people in need have their needs met on time, with respect, with principle, but in full support of the society and culture and government within which they live. For years to come, of our support for your policies and your efforts to bring peace and prosperity back to Borno, where it belongs and where it has been. The purpose of the UN is to support the government including the state government here, for the benefit of the people of Nigeria. And I think that is our common agenda. We need to do what is best for people here to overcome dependency on aid and to make their life more, more worth living. I want to categorically convey one message to you, that some of the islanders are not doing well. They are here to make money. They are here to create problems for us. And under no circumstances, government of no state will allow the leadership of the state government to be handled by them. And therefore, there is a need for us to separate the chap from the meat and deal decisively with those that are not willing to key into our own objectives. <laughs> Another laudable move by Professor Baba Genazulum is the launching of 100 taxis, 500 tricycles, and 10 41-seater buses to ease transportation challenges in Maiduguri metropolis and environs. This is the first of its kind the state has ever witnessed. At the ceremony, the governor noted that the vehicles will enhance urban mass transportation in Maiduguri, Jerry, and Konduga local government areas. 2,200 youths will benefit from the tricycles and the taxes and have 50% subsidy of repayment. During the launching, Governor Zulum also announced 50 million naira grant to 1,000 members of different tricycle operators who have not benefited from the urban transportation projects. 
This project will be recall becomes necessary and it is hoped to add more values to the lives of our people in several ways, especially at this time when Borno State is transiting from a decade-long insurgency period to a recovery phase. Government and indeed all sons and daughters of Borno State must share the responsibility of fixing the state by lending their support to our brothers and sisters who need the very essentials of life to survive in this most difficult times in our history. While government at all levels and its international partners are working hard to end the humanitarian crisis caused by the Boko Haram insurgency in our state, as elected leaders of our people, we must go out of our way to provide the enabling environment for our people to pick up their lives with the insurgents destroyed through whatever means possible. The State Commissioner for Transport, Abubakar Tujani, assured of effective and efficient supervision to ensure functional deployment to routes in line with the governor's goal of increasing access to mass transport in the metropolis. Your Excellency Sir, may I inform you that the Rose Traffic Management Agency board has been constituted and are ready to start work. The agency is new and will face a lot of challenges, but with your support, I want to assure Your Excellency that we do not empower the agency to carry out its assignment, the menace of traffic offenders will be minimized. This remarkable event will go down into the annal of history, not only in Borno State, but the country as a whole. No doubt that this social intervention will go a long way in boosting the state economy, provide job opportunities to unemployed youth and address transportation problem. I had a chat with the special advisor to Professor Baba Genazulum on public relation and strategic planning, Isa Guso, on some of the restoration mission of the state government. Take a listen. Welcome to Borno Restoration. Um, infrastructure and human development has been all-time high since Professor Baba Genazulum assumed office as the executive governor. Tell us about how his 10 packs development agenda contributed to the state's um, success story uh, when it comes to social economic advancement. I think one of the um, benefits of Professor Ragana or some of the unique qualities of him that the people of Bono have benefited from, in my opinion, are about three to four things. The first one is that he's an engineer. You know, engineers by their nature are driven by um, all kinds of developments, particularly infrastructure. Even though he's not a civil engineer, he's an irrigation engineer, but like some people will tell you, an engineer so he's an engineer. And even in the water sector where he specialized, there are lots of infrastructural um, things there. And then his background. Zulum was a rector in Ramat Polytechnic, and while he was a rector under the Shetima administration, he brought about a lot of uh, transformation at the Ramat Polytechnic. So in other words, he had the experience of doing some public sector infrastructural works while he was there. And then as Commissioner for Reconstruction, Rehabilitation and Resettlement under the Shetima administration, 30,000 houses were built during the Shetima administration and it was Zulu that coordinated you know, the whole of that. So he came with all of that background. And then being a Commissioner of RRR, you know one of the things about RRR is that it's interwoven. You just like information. The Ministry of Information, for instance, you know, is involved with virtually all the activities of all ministries or office of the SSG. So the Ministry of RRR is involved in all the sectors. So Zulum had the advantage of knowing, having a fair knowledge of what obtains in all the ministries. And then ultimately, which is far more important than everything, is the man's commitment. Professor Zulum is someone that is extremely committed. To be honest with you, when he started working as a governor, I started working with him. Not that I didn't trust him, but normally as a journalist, 
You know, journalists, we have critical mindsets. We are always suspicious. We, we, we are like academics. We see things from different um, sides. So I saw him, I said, well, maybe he's just a politician, like every other politician. Maybe he's just trying to impress. But over time, I got to know that this is who Zulim is. The man is not pretending. That is him. You cannot have 30 minutes conversation with Zulim without him talking about one project or the other. So it tells you that the man is a progressive in nature. He is developmental in nature. He's someone who wants to make impact. He goes to bed thinking about Borno. He wakes up thinking about Borno. He eats, he drinks thinking about Borno. And all of this drives his passion for development. And then I think um, talking about the Tempac agenda, you know that from day one, while he, while he, was, uh, he was campaigning, he had his blueprint or a projection of what he wanted to achieve. And don't forget that soon after he became governor, two days after he was sworn in, he started a uh, tour of 27 local government areas. I believe, I think he started with Goza, if I'm right. He went to Goza on 31st of May. Then from there, he came back to, to Bama and Konduga and then continued. He went around 27 local government areas, even though he had a familiar, he had a, he had a, he had some knowledge of most of the things while he was commissioner for RRR. But of course there were areas he couldn't have known because maybe they didn't have to do with his office, you know, at that time. So while he became governor, he went around on a needs assessment. So he armed himself with knowledge and understanding of the peculiarities of each of the 27 local government in terms of their needs. And then he also had consultations with key stakeholders, like members of state assemblies representing each part, each local government, the members of House of Reps and senators representing constituencies, the commissioners, former office holders, key other key stakeholders. So he did a lot of consultation to identify the priorities of each local government area. So he was armed with all of that. And then that's why he keeps moving. And one thing he keeps saying, um, which is really important, the governor would always tell you that what makes the private sector succeed over the public sector is the absence of supervision at the public sector level. He will give you an instance. You could find a teacher, for instance, who is teaching in, in the public school, maybe he earns 30,000 or 40 or 50,000 or even more than that. And you discover that that teacher doesn't go to class to teach. But you discover that the same teacher might be doing a lesson for someone, maybe in a private, in a private home where he's being given 10,000 Naira as salary. But that teacher never misses, you know, the, the, the lesson. The reason is because if he doesn't come, the mother of the child or the father would call him. So what Zulu ensures is strict supervision. That's why you see him appearing at project site 1 a.m. He goes to, 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 to hospitals at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. He appears in school 6 a.m. That is the kind of supervision and it works a lot. It energizes workers, it keeps everybody on its toes and that's why you're seeing the results. The state government has continued to show animal support to the military. Now, tell us what non-kinetic approach the state is adopting to uh, sustain the gains recorded so far. Governor Zulu, from day one, if you, as part of the Tempac agenda, did say that he was going to combine kinetic and non-kinetic uh, responses. And then the kinetic responses, which you know, within the first week he became governor, he increased the salary of the allowances of civilian GTFs. He ordered the employment, recruitment of thousands of hunters. He got them a lot of vehicles, you know, and deployed them. And then, like you know, the, the army itself has regularly acknowledged that the governor gives overwhelming support to the military, especially through, you know, gathering of information that often leads to actionable intelligence in addition to logistic support. Now, the non-kinetic is good leadership. One of the things that you achieve as a leader is being able to inspire people. And you can only inspire people when people believe in you, when they trust you. So the, the governor has earned that confidence. And then, of course, you know that the governor is always 
um, is the chief humanitarian officer of Borno State. Nobody can count the number of times Zulum has visited communities for humanitarian intervention. Only yesterday, as you know, we were in Malari, where he went to flag off a resettlement and, you know, and humanitarian support to a number of people. So the governor, part of the advantages of doing that is that you make people to believe in the system, to you discourage them from even contemplating joining the insurgents. Because frustration and hopelessness can actually lead someone to become a criminal. Where, for instance, the governor, you know, um, ignores IDPs who are homeless, who are displaced, they don't have anything to do, and somebody comes with a pro 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 you know, proposition that, look, you could join us as a spy, be giving Boko Haram or Iswap some information, they'll be giving you X amount of money per month. You know, you could have an economic-driven um, membership of the insurgents. You know that we have had instances where some women, some women were, were being paid as little as 10,000 to ferry rifles. You know, we have had a situation where some young men were given 5,000 naira to set schools ablaze. So what the governor is doing is deploying serious economic you know, responses in terms of supporting victims of terror, in terms of jobs creation, in terms of empowerment. That's why you see any time Zulu, you say that Zulu has taken 50 million, 100 million to the All of these incentives is to give people a reason to believe in the system, is to empower them, no matter how level, in such a way that it's impossible for insurgents to attract them with small amount of money. Because that 5, 10, 20,000, 50,000 that he gives to people, some people may see it as nothing. But let's also remember that some people were attracted with as little as five, ten thousand naira to work for insurgents. So this is part of the non-kinetic approach. And of course, you know that the governor has been advocating for insurgents to surrender their arms. So um, after Sheikha was killed, the governor thought that we should seize an opportunity. He increased his advocacy to to the um, to the insurgents for them to join, and then we see that opportunity. Some of them began to join, and they saw leadership in the governor. They saw they saw sincerity in the governor, and they realized that whatever Zulum says, he's not the kind of person who will speak from both sides of his mouth. When Zulum gave him their words, that look, when you guys surrender, inshallah, nothing will happen to you. And they, some of them came, and they realized that they are actually safe, and then they started calling their colleagues from the bush to surrender. And that is why you see relative peace in the Burma Banki Axis. You haven't heard of bomb, you haven't heard of attack. It's because majority of those insurgents who have surrendered are from Burma Banki Axis. And Alhamdulillah, we are getting more of them from other axis. You know, you heard of Iswap, about 104 Iswap families surrendering. So these are part of the non-kinetic approach and they are driven by the governor because of confidence that people have in him because he's discouraging people from joining and those who join is the you know have some level of protection because like the governor would always ask okay what do we do if we should we punish somebody who has committed who has done something which is really important this is what we prefer but the fact of the matter is that it is a difficult choice that we are making because the war has protracted we are in it now for about 12 years. So the governor would ask, okay, what do we do? Should we say that, okay, any Boko Haram member, we must prosecute them, and then some of them will want to leave. We say, okay, it's better we join Iswap to go and kill more people. Then do we secure the lives of more people, or do we insist on punishing them? Because by the time you are able to get one or two Boko Haram members to drop their arms, you have potentially saved the lives of people. So you ask yourself, which is more important? Is the punishment more important than saving the life of people? Anytime you see a government accepting a political solution to criminality is an admittance of the complexity of the challenge. And this has been what we have been advocating, you know, in the last 10 years. You know that since the, 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 the days of the late Eradua, there has been that advocacy, let's get, because you must fight the ideology you know and you cannot fight a 
complex group like that with only one method. Well, positive innovation is what distinguishes between a true leader and a ruler. That's our package on this episode of Borno Restoration. Thanks for watching. I am Jesse Tofida. See you next time. Bye-bye.